we talked, in fact, two years ago when we did this interview, you were talking about uh, opening night already. You had just finished uh, Chinese Bookie, mm -hmm. and uh, you were saying that uh, you were uh, uh, talking with uh, Gina already about the role that you had a lot of conversations to prepare the film and so on. And how did it get on? How did you finally come to the film? And on, did you start with the the idea of the of the woman's problem and then elaborated the the play starting from uh, her character and because the play inside the film we started from the need of the autograph girl i think um to to see what need uh, that would reflect on this actress and uh, the 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 idea had always been a woman sees in herself in this young fan um, everything that she was when she first entered into the profession of acting mm -hmm. and that's the way it started and we built off of that off of that uh, first encounter and the girl's consequent death which was always in there mm -hmm. by accident but I suppose uh, when you have a, a play like The Second Woman, which is not an original play, which is not a, a play, which is which a play that you wrote, sometimes in films about theater they use Chekhov or they use uh, Shakespeare or whatnot. Uh, so they, of course, they have to take some scenes. But in, in, in that particular case, I suppose you had to write a complete play. I had to write a complete play, which I never did because I hated the play so much within the play that I could never write anything in continuity with it. And, uh... You mean this play? Yeah. You hated it? Yes, I hated it because I had to take it from an actor's point of view. Uh, an actor's point of view would be that they didn't want to play in the play, and the play was not a successful play. So you don't want to take someone else's work because then you're saying someone yeah. else's work is very bad. Yes. And it's a very dangerous thing to write a bad play. It's an, it's, but yeah, not only dangerous, but very difficult. How c can you write a bad play? <laughs> yes. So you d just, I try to stay within the theme of the woman that wrote it, uh, the Joan Blontel character who wrote the play. Uh, was in her late 60s and, and uh, when she wrote the play, it was her definitive work on her life, that, that uh, age does get the better of you, mm. which is a depressing play to begin with, that age gets the better of you, even though there's some truth to it. And mm. certainly from her point of view, there was a lot of truth to it. But it's very difficult for a woman, uh, Jenna's age, to play that, because her life, as she expresses in the screenplay, is not over. She is not the same age. Mm. And uh, her problems are different. Her problems mm -hmm. are the problems of most women that, that uh, have passed that first flush mm -hmm. when nothing can go wrong because the, the pinks, the, the, they don't need rouge or anything. They can mm -hmm. just go out and be uh, absolutely mm -hmm. radiant just because their skin mm -hmm. is, is, is so new. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when the playwright writes his play, the from the performing artist's point of view, they have there are two problems. One, the problem of sophistication, and the other, the problem of uh, having to be part of that audience and understanding the character in relationship in relation to that audience. And when she can do neither, because the she's accused of being so close to the character that she can't even argue her point reasonably any longer. Mm -hmm. Then she begins to investigate her own situation in her life and sees a great deal of truth in the character she's playing, but it still does not alter her deep uh, feeling that she must communicate something hopeful to an audience, otherwise they will not listen. Mm -hmm. which is not a philosophical point of view, except for the actress, mm -hmm. that the audience will not listen to something unless it has something for them. If it had nothing for them, they're all going to leave. Mm -hmm. well, consequently, she feels that the play is a bad play, and that it's anything you can do to change it would be marvelous, but she can't find anything to change it. Mm -hmm. 
because you can't alter something by yourself. So she employs everyone's aid, and no one will go. And finally, you know, uh, only a, an actor who feels that uh, maybe his part is being jeopardized or something, who's had an affair with, with her, suddenly makes a fool of himself and throws the play away. Well, that's not what she had intended. Mm. But she goes along and finds out of that, that just that one moment of just saying, no, no, we're not going to be dead. We're not going to project death as, as the main thrust of this play. We're going to project life mm -hmm. and put age in its perspective. And uh, I feel that's what happened. An interesting thing is that most literary people, uh, people that have anything to do with writing, find that ending is just a terrible ending, simply because the author, the author's play, no matter how bad the play is, is uh, runs into shambles. Yeah, you know, it's pushed into pieces. Yeah, and they get uh, very angry at the at the actress, as they would in life, which mm -hmm. also makes us all part of one continuing uh, circle. Uh, the theater is the same as life. Life is the same as theater. The rituals may be slightly different. Uh, the problems are the same. They are always life problems. And, uh, and that we as the audience who look at the audience who are looking at the play, mm -hmm. I think respond very much the same way that the actual audience responds. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to me to mm -hmm. see the picture with the, with the responses because uh, I can't tell who is who is laughing or who is being irritated the uh, the audience within the movie or the the real audience. But uh, so you wrote the completely finally, you and then you chose certain scenes. Did you finally end up by writing it complete with scenes that we don't see in the film, or did you write only no. the specific scenes for the film? These scenes I mean they were much longer and. I spent all my time in the rehearsals uh, working with the actors on the play, writing different versions. The play was much longer and much more complete. But it you say much more complete, but was it ever complete? No. No. You no. just wrote uh, pieces that you needed for to reveal the I character. outlined uh, what would be, and uh, I just didn't see I, that I could sit down and write it. Mm -hmm. It's it just too dull to write. Mm. It would not be dull, but I'm not that Stanislavski. That I wasn't that in that kind of a mood of throwing myself completely into the uh, the problems of the problem of one of the characters, which would I, one of the one of the problems for a writer in writing a play like that is that you then you begin to make it better. You know, the play begins to be resolved. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never wanted to go that far, so I wanted to stay just with the specific scenes. Uh, because I found myself altering the whole concept of that play and trying to find what the actress was trying to find it in the play, some more mm -hmm. hopeful situation. And as that happened, uh, she lost her problem. There was no problem mm -hmm. without the play being uh, a depressing one. But what is your relation to the theater? Because you, you did you ever act in the, on the stage or? Yes, I have. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I was talking with Kazan about that last week. He had done both films and plays, uh, theater, and he said that finally the cinema is very, very different from the theater. In fact, for him, the cinema is closer to the novel, though maybe a lot of people think of the two being performing arts. But in fact, it's completely opposite. Do you feel that? I mean, how do you relate to the theater as? Well, uh, maybe I don't know uh, what uh, Gadge meant, but I, I, I think that what he probably meant was that uh, the theater is a contained form in itself. I mean, it isn't an mm -hmm. adaptation. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't translating ideas into mm -hmm. a different form. You, those forms are right there. Mm -hmm. You write in the form of, of mm -hmm. words mm -hmm. as ideas that will paint pictures and, uh, in film. You have to paint pictures and accommodate the words to those pictures. Uh, and
and the words don't necessarily have anything to do with what is happening because you have that other dimension mm -hmm. of life where you can go in and say absolute lies and if you do that on the stage nobody knows what you're saying mm -hmm. because the distance is a little further mm -hmm. to the performers and it's more audio than uh, visual no, but I was, I, I, you know, I thought of your movies as really the most anti theatrical in the way because they try to capture moments of truth and, and like kind of use of microscope on the faces and on, you know, the, whereas the, the, the theater is the most, is much more stylized and, and abstract in a way. It's, it's, you know, it's much more at arm's length. So you, your aesthetics is very po opposed to the. Well, it's a different form. Mm -hmm. It's a different form. No, but there are some directors in the cin cinema that you can more relate to theatrical. Uh, you know, if you see Eisenstein's Ivan, Ivan the Terrible, or even uh, Wells, in a way. You know, the, the way they, they don't shoot like they, I don't mean that their play, their films are stage, are film plays at all. Yeah. But I mean, you can see the a theatricality in their films, which you could switch to the stage. But in your films, you know, it's very opposite. So I, I thought that maybe you were, you, you felt quite distant to the theater. But you know, it's interesting to know that you were writing them as plays before. Yeah, well, I, I really just believe that there is a form where you, if, if you even if you read uh, the script of uh, Opening Night, you'll see that it's written quite as a theater piece. I disagree that that uh, that. Uh, I'm farther away from the, uh, the theater, and that that those those things are very uh, obscure. I mean, those uh, points are, are minuscule. I don't think they're minuscule. I think the the uh, high drama, in terms of what I'm doing anyway, would be thematically. Uh, the the theme of age is a small thing, is not a large, uh, defined. Subject. It's it's a frightening because it's like a germ, mm -hmm. and once you catch that disease, you can't. There is no cure for it. Mm -hmm. So you, the, the very nature of doing small things is is the manner and shape of of that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the theater is is extremely formal, mm -hmm. so that in the work rehearsal, the work ethic, or the work uh, idea. Uh, you go to usually to a, a damp backstage uh, thing and rehearse on the stage with a overhead light, and uh, we have gotten to know that as a theatrical thing. So when we see that on the screen, we recognize it, and it appears to us to be theatrical because it's so familiar, mm -hmm. and the truth of it is so familiar. Uh, Within the framework of the of the uh, the New York theater, and I was shooting in San Diego. I mean, in uh, Pasadena, California, and Los Angeles, California. Uh, there are no such theaters, <laughs> and so that we took a, a much more theatrical approach to what the theater would look like, simply because uh, uh, it would be better to have the essence of the theater there than to have. Uh, to go out and construct sets that would really look like sets and, and not have the age, the, the, the several years behind it that, that it needs to have to, to have that mm -hmm. feeling, the creaking of the floors and the, the, and for the actors as they walk along the set to make them feel like that they're, they're there. So, I mean, we, we tried to do that. Now, we, we screened the picture in New York, I mean, for friends and, and people in the theater, actors, and they really believed they were in the theater. They really believe that these were actors' problems, and uh, and the aging thing. Uh, I'm, there must have been at least 30 actors now that have come to me and said, "Listen, we have the same problem, or we've just gone through the same problem on Broadway. We're right in the midst of a play that the exact same thing is happening, where people are out two days and they're in one day and they can't perform because they feel inadequate." and incapable of communicating with their audience or having anything of value or worth in themselves to uh, stimulate an audience with, <laughs> which to me is an age problem. It's a, a problem of having been there 
and, f and feeling defeated already. But it was normal that you should finally come with doing, by doing a film uh, about an, an actor because you've always been fascinated by actors, just, you know, the problem of the actor in your films. You know, the, the, the part the actors play, which is even more important than any other film, you know, the way you, you collaborate with them and so on. So normally it should end up by, by doing a film about an actor's career or an actor's uh, <coughs> problem. Yes, uh, the big problem with uh, for Jenna, which I think it was the most difficult part, is that she was having a problem, and if she played the play and she was marvelous in the play, there would be absolutely no way that she could have a problem. You see? So the material had nothing really to do with it. I, you know, in her performing, she couldn't just appear to be bad so that we could suit the, the storyline. The problem would have to be a real problem so that the audience, too, would be feeling the, her own incompetence for whatever reason that she had on that stage. And uh, I feel that it had to manifest itself in changes in the play and the theory and the of what was wrong with the play, rather than the specific lines of the play or the specific scenes themselves. And uh, I think that from, from that point of view, I'm, I'm quite, uh, uh, quite relieved that we were able to do that. And I think that Jenna carried that off extremely well, uh, not wanting to play the part and at times playing it but you could feel the dissatisfaction of the lack of continuity of any particular place that she had because she never made that complete communication. It was too spasmodic mm -hmm. uh, with her audience. It was in and out as life is in and out when you have a problem. And um, I liked it. It was a rather heavily loaded with, with many ideas, which always makes a very difficult picture. Uh, and very, not so easily defined. It's very much like a first film, you know, it's, in, it's packed with different themes. It, you know, it's like when you, uh, you make first film, you, there's a kind of exuberance and baroque mm -hmm. almost in the construction. And the film, though it's your eighth, eighth film, a film yeah, ninth film, ninth film. Yeah. It, it has a look of a first film and it's kind of, uh, it's more, I think it looks more, I mean, there was something more um, in Minian Moscovich and Women Under the Influence. It was as if it was kind of uh, perfection within a certain tendency. But yeah. I think this, it seems to me the Chinese book and this film are um, kind of new departure for you in the sense that you are, uh, you are using um, almost classical situations, uh, you know, cl classical types of subjects like uh, the, th the gangster film or the, p the film, the play within the film, which are, which have been done many, many times. I and mean, when you, when you see faces or when you see uh, women under the influence, it's, um, it's kind of look at, at life without any kind of reference to a cultural, uh, traditional Hollywood subject matter. But Chinese book and this film are have been done, you know, many times. Star is Born, or all of, all the gangster films, and, and all the all the films about about acting, which mm -hmm. are kind of. Mm -hmm. So for you, it was interesting to see your your uh, very um, your approach to reality, which is very different from any type of stylization and form, formal aspects, and and dealing with with this kind of subject matter, which is which is a kind of an archetype or something that has been, has been done many times. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that, that you were going into a kind mm -hmm. of new experience? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, obviously that uh, my life in the, in the theater up to, the, up to this picture and uh, Jenna's life in, in the theater up to this picture, uh, both of these pictures has been uh, so deeply personal. Uh, filled with such convictions, not 
worked out situations that we might be very close to, but we don't really have any idea mm -hmm. of the continuity of our, uh, our lives because they're spread out over such a, a long period of time. And so it was, uh, it was a different idea, much more, um, for instance, in opening night, if you notice, uh, the actress's point of view is not her own, and yet she's got an enormous part. But it's always that we see this woman rather than we are with her. So we never use the device, which is a very simple device that every one of us use, and that is to take uh, uh, the performer's, the main character's point of view. Therefore, the audience begins through that architecture to be to empathize greatly with the character or be against the character whatever but when you're just looking at a person like a stranger and not knowing them at all it's very difficult to get behind them because they are like a stranger it isn't so easy when you don't see why they are doing these things and what they are doing and now we have an actress which is a kind of a mysterious thing even to actors mm -hmm. uh, of why they're behaving in a certain way why did she get drunk the night of, of the show uh, I believe that she got drunk because she couldn't go on sober it was simple as that I don't think that she could go on sober why did they let her go on the stage in such a terrible condition it's because they want uh, the theater more than anything else mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with money or sense sanity mm -hmm. so what they did to her at the end of the play by throwing on this hopelessly drunk uh, woman who can't even stand up they threw her onto the stage she did the exact same thing by trying to save herself you know to them to those people that threw her out onto the stage mm -hmm. And uh, as, as we see these things develop, they are very hard to construct in a non-clumsy way because they don't have any root of, uh, of something that the audience has seen or, or known before. These are just absolutely new territories. It's walking out into the mud, you know, you don't know when you're going to go over your head or when you're not or how an audience will, will behave. Most emotions that uh, filmmakers do are based upon something that they already know and that they already have seen and that mm -hmm. the audience already knows and usually agrees with. Mm -hmm. you know? And when you take a, a, a subject that, one, nobody wants to talk about, two, the, the, the meilleur is one which is is uh, strange and obscure to most people, except in a theatricalized form, it becomes a very difficult movie. And yet I feel that particularly the women were, I think, deeply affected uh, by the personal uh, problem of, of that actress and by the fact that she is absolutely alone and doesn't know it and who needs men, even though she's an independent working woman, and who uh, fights like a, a demon to keep her place in Rome. But you shot with a real audience. Yes. But since you, you didn't have a complete play, what, you, you, you had extras and uh, you, they were extras that came in the old, in the theater? We, we, um, some friends of mine um, put out a few pamphlets and made phone calls and called up different groups mm -hmm. and said, would they like to come and be an audience watching a play, uh, a movie being shot, and they would be the audience in the movie Mm -hmm. And all they would have to do was just be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when opening night came, they said, well, should we dress up and everything? And I said, yes, if you want to. So they all came dressed in 
and gowns and tuxedos, and it was very interesting because it was many, many days. But they, they saw only uh, small scenes because what you were shooting. Uh, well, for instance, the last one. How how long is it in the film? The the last. The last scene. Yes. It was originally about uh, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It was orig originally 20 minutes. Is Now it? it's about uh, seven minutes, eight mm -hmm. minutes. So they had time to because it's. They, they had enough of, of, of the play to watch to react because it's very difficult to react if you have only a small bit. Yes, I, and we talked to the audience while they were there because it's a long day in making a film and everything. And uh, in between the scenes, setups have to be made. So we try to prepare so we can go as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, there would be no rehearsal for the audience on the stage because. Mm -hmm. You bring the curtain down and you, they hear what's going on and then they mm -hmm. see it and they become too geared. Yes. So what we did is, uh, like when Jen and I did our scene, I just said, all right, let's try it, it once very straight. I went to the audience and said, we're going to do this scene now. And uh, we will want you to behave and react the way you would react. If you don't like mm -hmm. it, then don't like it. If you do, then do. And, and that's the way we'll, we'll go. So we played it the first time, and it worked fairly well in a straight way. And at the end of the, the play, they said, they sat there, and we said, we'd like to try it one more time, and perhaps in a different way, because our story is of an actress who is totally drunk on the stage, which we, di we didn't do that time, mm -hmm. so that they were aware of that, and their interest peaked a little bit. And we did it again. I was terrible. Uh, I couldn't, didn't know what the hell to do myself. And Jenna said, well, what are we, what are we, I said, well, we'll play it a little broad now. And then uh, at the, their response was fair. So then we said, all right, now this is what happens when all stops are pulled, you know, and we'll see what happens. So we did it the third time. And that was the third take that was in the, uh, in the film, and, and they responded as they responded, and they responded mm -hmm. uh, very, very well to the relationship between those two people, which had absolutely nothing to do with the play, except mm -hmm. that there was a relationship between a man and a woman on a living level, rather than a man and a woman on a, on a uh, uh, I don't mean to knock English movies, but an English movie, hello mm -hmm. dear, how are mm -hmm. you dear? Mm -hmm. I'm fine, how are you? You know, we are getting older. Yes, we are. You, mm -hmm. you know, I get up in the morning, I look at the mirror, and there's something deeply cynical in my face. But instead of doing that, we played at such a height and such a hostility between each other mm -hmm. that it became like a, a situation comedy. Uh, and um, with basically the same lines. Uh, you know, the only difference, the changes were that we repeated a line once in a while if there was not a response we just would mm -hmm. repeat our cue to the next person at the very end we had written improvisation which was shot once uh, oddly mm -hmm. because we you, you couldn't do it more than once the improvisation quality because the audience thought we were leaving the play which indeed these actors were but it was written <laughs> And we were plenty worried about it. You know, we were very worried what would happen. And so it put the same pressure that, that those actors would have on us by playing it only that one time. Ben is a marvelous actor in, in Chinese bookie, which many people uh, feel as you do, that it's a gangster genre. I don't really feel it is. I don't think it's a gangster film, but I think it starts I mean, you, you, it's a very Cassavetes film at the end, but uh, at the end, I mean, when it is actually seen on the screen. Yeah. What I call the end, not the end of the film. But what I mean is that, obviously, you, you were... I mean, when you see faces of husbands, uh, you know, they are... Uh, they don't refer to any specific genre. But here, obviously, a man who is a gambler, who has a striptease, uh, you know, place, and uh, who loses money, gets into the mafia, who asks him to kill somebody, and so on. It's, you know, it's a very, it's, you know, it's plot that we have seen. But this is not a criticism, but it's something that we have seen 
as a starting point, whereas the other films that you did were. So I think it belongs. It belongs to the genre in the in terms of reference. I'm obviously. going to cry because that isn't really. I, I, I obviously that is true. Obviously, yeah. what you're saying is true. And it's yet, not what is on the screen. It's not what is on the screen. But what my motivation for doing the picture was, uh, and this isn't a justification. I would drive on Sunset Boulevard every day to go to work, and along the way, I would see all these strip joints mm -hmm. along Sunset Boulevard. And I was wondering, as I went by and looked, you can't help but looking at these pictures, mm -hmm. more, come and get it, whatever those expressions are, I was wondering what kind of a person yes. would own a place where groups of people would sit silently, uh, sit there and, 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 and look at flesh, and, 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 uh, and what kind of people would perform, and why did they perform? Mm -hmm. In our society, why? What is this need to be such exhibitionism, uh, exhibitionists in a certain area, in a, in a sexual area? And uh, so I went in and I stopped one afternoon on the way back, and I talked to one of these men. And he took me out and he showed me his car, and he told me how many gangsters come into his place, and. But not all the time, but he told me specifically, according to their importance, who had been in and who knew him. And he also told me that he did his own acts. Uh, he structured them, he wrote them, he had the finest girls, the most beautiful girls, and, and he showed me what he had built in terms of his stage, uh, his sound system, everything. He took enormous pride in this. <laughs> And I walked in there and I saw a world which was part of an American world, but maybe part of the, the whole uh, world, because they have strip places everywhere. And I, I kind of liked that man. And he was a very conventional uh, man. He wore a tie, uh, special shirts made very much like gangster shirts, uh, shoes, absolutely uh, done right. When he went out, he wore a hat, <laughs> you know, looked like Humphrey Bogart. Um, special cigarette case, uh, holders, uh, fantastic. The glasses were, were not plastic. Mm -hmm. Everything in the place was more ornate than, than most restaurants or most uh, cafes would be. So I... I went and we finished a woman under the influence and it I was going mad in distribution uh, you know distributing the film talking to theater owners and everything all day long and and it was a business life and I got panicked and I thought what could I do that 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 would be uh, easy to get on easy to do within the area of where we are now and uh, I got everyone together, all the people, and I said, well, would anyone like to make a movie? We could start shooting in, in two weeks. And they said, well, what are we going to shoot? And I said, well, I'll write something as we go. We got, out, we got all the people together, and I started writing this script about how these gangsters want more, and they want more, and they want more. They don't even know what they want and that the people within that society, which I li liken really to all of American life, in, in that no one knows what they're working for. They only know they want to do it in the right way and be good at what they're doing. But they are mindless because there is nothing to think about because the object is making money and doing it with style. <laughs> and so Chinese Bookie was to me not a gangster film so much as as uh, a, a, the ethic, the work ethic in our country being so that you are put in a position of doing your work without any basis of any individuality in your own life. So that you have to apply yourself to what other people want. And mm -hmm. uh, a nightclub and owner 
mm. would apply himself to what other people want. Mm. The people do it, uh, television people do it, uh, everybody in our, in our world, people that sell gas or, or they... Mm -hmm. You only exist for others. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing of yourself. So the mm. society we live in is an anti-art society in that it is conforming to one point of view. Mm -hmm. And that point of view is what must be done in the manner that it must be done. Mm -hmm. So the, this man, when he loses $25,000 in a, in a cheap set-up card game, he thanks everyone because he doesn't want to be the kind of person that would exhibit the wrong kind of emotions. Mm -hmm. And he shakes their hands and he says goodbye and it's all done extremely formally. But, but it could have been a comedy. That situation to me is so true that it could have been a comedy had Ben gone over and said thank you very much in a certain way and done it broader. Mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. You know, and the whole picture would have taken on, a, um, he would have become an anti-hero then, which in that sense would have been a hero. Mm -hmm. But instead he played it with the talent that he has as a good actor trying to understand that situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people wouldn't, would not want to see uh, innocence being crushed and somebody that's trying in their life being destroyed. In my opinion, and the opinion of Ben and everyone else who worked with, within the framework of that picture, it's a, a very necessary picture for people to see because uh, it shows you that even if you do the right thing, you may not be starting out in, in, in a direction that has any validity. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I do, you know, it's like saying I will kill people, but I will kill people very nicely. And then you're upset because somebody punishes you for <laughs> killing them nicely. And I think that that's our age today. Mm -hmm. and it's very pertinent to, to what is going on, particularly with young people. They, they are idealistic in their approach to their own violence and their own peculiar withdrawals. And they use, uh, they use life as its example. And uh, life is not particularly a good example as politically or economically is not a good example of how to live your life, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. anyway. No, but I mean, I don't want you to, to misunderstand me. I didn't mean that the film, as I see it, is a gangster film. I mean, I agree. I mean, what you said about the character and, and, and the poetry of, of the film and, and the, the night atmosphere and the loneliness and so on is obviously what is important in the film. It's not the, the plot. <coughs> but what I was saying is that you were using the plot and the devices of, of a gangster film starting, you know, in the same way as in, in opening night you use the, the relationship theater, yeah. of the theater and yeah. the film, which has been done also many times. The result is completely yours and it has nothing to do with the the starting point. But yes, still I, I think I'm a little sensitive about hmm. that. No, but it's the starting point, whereas in uh, you know, the starting point in your other films was no reference. I, would, I don't say it against or for, it's just, you know... Uh, well, in America, you see, well, we opened the picture in, in, uh, in Los Angeles and New York, and the people flocked to go to see the film. You know, and they Which one? The, the Chinese book. Chinese book, yeah. And they really went in, in en masse, and we got absolutely killed by the critics. Mm -hmm. you know, killed. No, I, what what you said about uh, you know the the dire the the striptease owner, joint owner, uh, doing what you know, people expect him to do and so on, living for others, uh, that's you know raises the question of of your position in Hollywood because I, you know as as a filmmaker because I I find uh, between you and me I mean I even wrote it in the Herald Tribune I, I had an interview with Mary Bloom uh, two weeks ago I said that about. Amer new American films in the last three or four years, I, I, I find that the, the movies tend to be very impersonal, I mean, uh, which I never felt as much about Hollywood. I mean, I, uh, I thought in the early 70s with people like Altman, like uh, Boorman, like Schatzberg, like, uh, uh, like um, Bob Raffleson, mm -hmm. not to speak of you, mm -hmm. of course, but they, they were really independent artists who were really putting their personal problems, their feelings on the screen, you know, whatever 
uh, way, but uh, I found in, in the recent films uh, kind of uh, technical achievements and, and very little content, I mean, very little uh, mm -hmm. feeling. Do you, f you feel this yourself as, as trying to create in, in this yes, context? Yes, and ta talking with, uh, with other directors, their views all seem to be that we'll be creative within the the advisability of the subjects given to us by uh, by the major companies or by the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know that the tax shelters make terrible movies, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> because their their whole basis is the money, mm -hmm. absolutely as a device to get rid of or to take an advantage mm -hmm. through money. Uh, we also know that that the major companies are going to make hundreds of million dollars of dollars with a movie and they will not tolerate uh, somebody departing and taking a gamble at that kind of of um, money so that experimentation mm -hmm. that the the artist is paid for his skill not for the mind or the feeling mm -hmm. and within that uh, the spielbergs and the lucases and the other people find uh, Everybody, you know, the Altmans, everybody begins mm -hmm. to work in this paranoid atmosphere of trying to get in to mm -hmm. their films, points, ideas, but it isn't the overall film. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the, the, the threat of never making another film unless we conform mm -hmm. is terrible. And what has happened is the critics and the festivals have always been the only weapon mm -hmm. of... Uh, of creative people. Mm -hmm. It's the only weapon for, for mm -hmm. a, a young filmmaker coming up. He mm -hmm. will never get to make a film if mm -hmm. it isn't for the critic mm -hmm. and for the festivals. And even for older filmmakers like you, I mean, independent filmmakers, it's a help. Yes, and now uh, I, I think that the, the best thing that a young filmmaker can do is to beat an older filmmaker and a more established mm -hmm. filmmaker, such, such as myself. Mm -hmm. I would love to go into a festival and, and have, but I want it to be competitive because mm -hmm. that's the only real opportunity mm -hmm. for a young filmmaker is to, is to win. I feel terrible because I'm in a position at 48 years old of being a revolutionary. And I don't feel very revolutionary. Uh, it's time for me almost to, to say, look, let me make my films the way I want to, and I don't care really about success or uh, going anywhere or doing anything. I just want to, mm -hmm. until I can't do it anymore, I, I want to just do what I do mm -hmm. and let the young people come and show me the way. Mm -hmm. You know, to be in a position of having to constantly uh, not fight a creative battle, but go out and fight a commercial battle is terrible. And every young filmmaker is a closet communist. Mm -hmm. You know, they mm -hmm. only come out when the money is there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you offer a young filmmaker a job with Universal Pictures and they will uh, jump up and down and mm -hmm. say, I made money. Mm -hmm. I get a job offered to meet uh, with those major companies and I feel depressed. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I don't want the money. I want the money. That's why mm -hmm. I feel depressed that I can't take mm -hmm. it. You, you know, but if it, if eight, at eighteen or twenty or twenty-five, somebody is already saying, "Bail me out, save me." What what chance do they have to make a, mm -hmm. something of any kind of worth and value? Mm -hmm. I think that all of us uh, are, in a sense, uh, excited like a, a monk in a monastery would be excited over life, over finding some point in life, and then add wings to the monk and allow him to take on these challenges and create a different world, to actually have the capacity to create that different world is a fantastic uh, Excitement. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, sexual almost. It's, it's uh, certainly a substitute for living, mm -hmm. but it's better than living. And when people begin to say, okay, we can make money 
on that aspect because these people will work harder at what they're doing than anyone else in the world and we and other people are interested in what they're doing and they will pay then we must protect somebody must protect that that and not make it just a whore's game mm -hmm. you know and we can say it's not but it is it's for me and it's for everyone else i'm not mm -hmm. making myself uh, uh, alone thank you